Hi, well, today I've got the privilege of being joined once again by Brendan Beader. Brendan is not only a, an experienced immigration lawyer and immigration law trainer, he's also an executive coach and works in the area as well of, of well-being. And today we're going to talk about psychological safety. And I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating uh, discussion that will have lots of practical takeaways for those who run law firms, lawyers themselves. Because I think over the last few years, we've realised the importance of our well-being and psychological and mental health, both personally and in the workplace and in the environments we create. And if you haven't watched the previous video that Brendan and I did about two years ago on when well-being in the workplace, I'll link it below this video. So Brendan, thank you so much for coming back again. What, what's been happening since we last spoke? Well, thank you so much, uh, Adam. Um, before I talk about what's happening on my side, Adam, perhaps I can just say what a debt of gratitude we owe you in the profession at the moment. Your output, your input is truly remarkable. I, I don't know how you deal with it. I thought I was dealing with a lot, but um, thank you, very, very much thank appreciated. It's, it's been a busy time and, and happily so. Um, I've continued that steady transition of spending less time at the office. And obviously I've been spending 30 years now, we had our 30th anniversary on the 1st of December dealing with immigration work. And it's really put that into clear focus, just the passage of time, how much has actually changed. And um, I now spend at least half the week dealing with all of those areas relating to well-being, psychological safety and coaching. And I really wanted today, Adam, to share with you and with our colleagues, a particularly exciting approach to creating profitable, resilient, and forward-thinking law firms. We've been doing a lot of work in relation to psychological safety in a number of sectors, which we're told has brought about significant beneficial change. And my mission, Adam, for the year ahead is to shine the spotlight very clearly on psychological safety in firms of solicitors and law profession as a whole, where it's clearly so desperately needed. I was delighted to be chosen to partake in an accreditation program and now one of a limited number of people in the UK licensed by the US fearless organization to provide psychological safety sessions and workshops, which includes the administering and debriefing of something called the fearless organization scan, which I'll tell you more about a little bit later, if I may. Um, but going back for a moment, in 2012, we had Google initiating a quest codenamed Project Aristotle to discover the answer to that elusive question, what makes teams successful? How do you create the best possible team? And drawing on years of research, including most notably the research undertaken by Harvard professor Amy Edmondson, they concluded that it was not the cleverest people, not the people from the best universities or from the same background. It was rather how that team interacts, the creation of an environment with a high level of psychological safety, the key factor differentiating higher and lower performing teams. I think that's that's fantastic that the whole idea of create sort of combining high performance successful teams with this priority of well-being and psychological safety so just to help us because for a lot of people the term psychological safety will be completely new what exactly is psychological safety Brendan? Of course so psychological safety Adam refers to a, a work environment where employees feel safe to express themselves without fear of judgment or punishment. It's a belief that one can speak up without retaliation or negative consequences. It allows for more open communication for collaboration and innovation, all of which of course are essential to the success of any organization. To, today we'll be discussing why psychological safety is crucial in creating that environment where employees 
and feel safe to express their ideas, to share their opinions and take risks without fear of negative consequences. We'll explore the concept and its impact on the success of British firms of solicitors and the profession as a whole, drawing on examples from Professor Amy Edmondson and the Fearless Organization. So let me start maybe, Adam, by asking you, have you ever sat in a key meeting desperately wanting to contribute, but feeling unable to do so, or possibly feeling overwhelmed with your volume of work, but not feeling sufficiently safe to speak up in case others think he's not coping? Have you ever felt that you must ask a question at work, but decided not to because you didn't want to look ignorant? possibly not challenge something because you didn't want to seem negative, or maybe, in fact, you've backed away from a challenge or a solution to a clear problem in order to avoid giving the impression that you're undermining your boss. Now, if you answer yes to any of these questions, it's highly probable that you don't feel psychologically safe at work. So, Adam, Nobody wakes up in the morning thinking, oh, today I want to look ignorant at work. <laughs> today I want to seem as incompetent as possible. Today I want to be disruptive and totally negative. So at an early stage, Adam, of our lives, we learn how to manage interpersonal skills, interpersonal risk rather. Um, at some point during primary school, children start to recognize that what others think of them matters, and they learn accordingly how to lower the risk of rejection or scorn. And by the time we're adults, we're usually really good at this. Don't want to look ignorant. Don't ask questions don't want to look incompetent, don't admit to mistakes or weaknesses, don't want to be called disruptive, don't make suggestions. The problem with sitting on our hands and staying within these lines rather than speaking up is that although these behaviors keep us personally safe, they can make us underperform and become dissatisfied. They can also put our organization at risk. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. The whole thing of we're protecting ourselves, but actually, we, as a result, we're underperforming uh, and the organization not not fully performing. And, and I wanted to ask you, before we go further in terms of psychological yes. safety, what are the issues or the dangers where in a workplace, in an in a environment, it, psychological safety is, is absent? What, what are the dangers there? Yeah, good question. <laughs> The, the fear of speaking up, Adam, can lead to accidents that were in fact avoidable. Remaining silent due to fear of interpersonal risk can make the difference in some cases between life and death. Uh, Aeroplanes have crashed, financial institutions have fallen, hospital patients have died unnecessarily because individuals were, for reasons having to do with the climate in which they worked, um, afraid to speak up. Uh, let's look perhaps at the most extreme example of not speaking up, of remaining silent at a critical moment and the tragic result. I'm sure many people will have heard that in March 1977, workplace silence actually played a major role in the collision of two Boeing 747 jumbo jets on an island runway in Tenerife. The crash ignited both planes, resulting in the death of 583 people. And subsequent investigations, Adam, into what has been called the Tenerife disaster, it's still considered actually the, world, uh, the world's worst accident in the history of uh, civil aviation. Uh, these were among the first to study the roles played by human factors in airline fatalities. And, the resulting changes made to aviation procedures and cockpit uh, protocol laid the groundwork for some of today's most crucial psychological safety measures. If we look closely, Adam, into what was said, or more 
significantly perhaps what was not said, we can better understand the outsized role played by psychological safety. So the captain of the KLM jumbo jet was one of the company's most senior pilots and he was actually the chief uh, flight trainer as well. And in the cockpit with him on that fateful day were two other senior pilots. There used to be three in the old jumbo jets in the cockpit. Importantly, two months earlier, that captain had been his co-pilot's check pilot, testing his ability to fly that very plane. And the crucial moment came as the KLM plane was preparing to take off and being asked to hold their position. The captain, impatient to get off the ground, despite heavy fog, which severely restricted the visibility, did not wait for control tower clearance for takeoff and said, we're going. And despite the fact that both the co-pilot and the flight engineer, both extremely experienced and, and senior individuals, um, and both sitting in the cockpit with the captain, they realized this was extremely unsafe, realizing not only that their lives were at risk, but the lives of all the passengers and possibly another plane out there. They felt unable, and this is the crucial bit, Adam, they felt unable at that vital moment to challenge the authority of their captain. So the co-pilot's reticence to speak up indicates that distinct lack, the distinct lack of that psychological safety that would have made such a query all but second nature, in fact, but they both felt unable to challenge their captain's authority. And sadly, a few seconds later, it was too late when the pilots realized that there was in fact a Pan Am 747 jet blocking their way the two planes collided and this resulted in a huge fireball that led to the hundreds of deaths and Adam similar situations sadly continue to arise in operating theaters around the world where a nurse perhaps notices that a surgeon or anesthetist is doing something which could cause the patient harm but feels unable to speak up in that moment perhaps because that doctor had previously hold off or, or maybe belittle that nurse in front of the nurse's colleagues. This is really the issue. Mm. Wow, powerful examples. But people may be thinking, well, I'm not an airline pilot. How does it apply to us? Why is psychological safety important to those who work in the professions? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So Adam, the examples which I've just cited absolutely may seem like extreme cases and and it's a good question to ask, why is this therefore relevant to daily practice in a law firm? But the truth is, we're dealing with a long established hierarchical system in the law profession. And this lends itself, sadly, to problems. The example of senior partners feeling that they're above reproach, neither approachable nor accountable. And this leads to a distinct lack of psychological safety. Um, what about the introverted, long-standing and experienced member of staff with a wealth of knowledge, mm. experience and skill? So often this person is crowded out by the fast talking loud extrovert who very often has very little of value to contribute. In, in psychological safety, we practice conversational turn-taking where everyone is given an opportunity to contribute their views and opinions on an issue. And very importantly as well, equal time is given to each individual so that the hidden gems of knowledge and expertise are not missed. But speaking alone is not enough, Adam. Equally significant, and I remember we talked about this with well-being some time ago, is what we refer to as generative or ostentatious listening. This is where a team member or team leader must show that they're truly listening, that um, my valued team member is, is being truly heard. And to maximize benefit, this culture of psychological safety and these vital practices should really permeate right through every level 
of the firm. So often we've got trainee solicitors kept at arm's length from direct involvement with partners, the attitude of let the newbie trainee solicitor know his or her place and do their time. We'll hear from them later when they are, to our mind, um, sufficiently trained and senior. In other words, there's nothing they can offer us at the moment other than, of course, their long hours sometimes referred to them, uh, to buy them as a, as a slave labor in essence. Now, a golden opportunity for the senior echelon of a firm to learn from the newbie is being missed here because these people will often have come from top educational establishments, have been exposed to new ideas and research. They'll bring niche expertise. They might have consulted, bring a, a fresh perspective to the firm, possibly even identifying, probably quite often so, a malignant or toxic culture within the firm, which if addressed could enormously benefit everyone. The truth is there's so much to learn from a newbie freshly arrived at a firm. Um, psychological safety in essence is critical, Adam, for the success of these firms of solicitors for all these reasons. It, it allows employees to share their ideas, their opinions which lead to better decision-making and problem-solving. When employees feel comfortable expressing themselves, they are going to be more likely to share their unique perspective and their experience. Uh, that will lead to a more diverse range of ideas and solutions. Um, in addition, psychological safety will also foster a culture of that vital element, trust and respect when employees feel safe, they're going to be more likely to trust their colleagues and their managers. And this in turn will lead to stronger relationships and a more positive work environment. And this in turn, of course, leads to increased job satisfaction and ultimately employee retention. I think that's so important because sometimes when we do these discussions on well-being and these sort of topics, people think, oh, that's just the fluffy stuff. We're actually it's better for the bottom line and we're creating better performing firms and individual lawyers, yeah. uh, absolutely. So a number of people watching may run their own law firm or, or small business. How, how do they create that culture? Because creating culture is so important. How do you create a culture of psychological safety within yeah. the organization you run? Well, creating a culture of psychological safety takes uh, Courage. It's, it's essential, however, for the um, success of British firms of solicitors. Um, perhaps just uh, a, a few tips, obviously, very significantly lead by example. Leaders should model the behavior that they want to see in their own employees. They need to be open, they need to be honest and transparent. This will be valued. They need to encourage open communication. Employees should feel comfortable expressing their views and opinions without fear of ridicule. Uh, team members should feel able to push the limits and where mistakes, and this is very significant in mm -hmm. the study of psychological safety, where mistakes are made, they should not feel that they will be targeted by their teams, but rather that they will be supported so that the team goes on to explore the complexity of the situation, learn from the, mistake, uh, from the mistake and emerge stronger and more able to avoid that mistake being repeated. The key, Adam, is not to point that finger <laughs> at the individual, um, at he who makes the mistake, but rather to look at the complexity of the situation as to why those mistakes are likely to happen. And in a supportive and a thorough addressing of this, find a way to actually learn from the mistakes and do better next time. All the while enhancing the confidence, the unity and the synergy of the team involved. It, it's really about looking at mistakes from a different perspective. Um, there are three lovely quotes that come to mind. Uh, Thomas say Edison, of course, with that famous, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Or, or Theodore Roosevelt, who said, the only man who's never made a mistake is the man who never does anything. 
And of course, then also more recently, Michael Jordan. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games 26 times. I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and I've missed. I failed over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. And that really says it all. That, that's so helpful. And I think this whole idea of reframing mistakes and failure is, is, is so important, absolutely. especially in a culture of social media where people just want to put forward their successes and not own up to, to their failures. So why is this so important to us in the UK? Sometimes I, th I think, you know, you talked about being trained by an American organization. Why yeah. is this relevant now for, for UK law firms who are perhaps a bit sort of um, stuck in the mud with these sort of things? Yeah, well, psychological safety, Adam, refers to, of course, that perception, that perception by the individual of the consequence of taking the interpersonal risk within a group. And it's about feeling safe to speak up, to share ideas. And in that sense, it's essential for law firms because when employees feel psychologically safe, they're going to collaborate, they're going to take calculated risks, they're going to innovate. And all of this, of course, is going to be crucial for every law firm to stay competitive. It, it's also no secret, and we've touched on this already, that mental health issues are on the increase among people who work in the legal profession. Combative, um, competitive, uh, perfectionist, pressurized, controlled, judgmental, these are the sort of words used by colleagues to describe the culture in which we operate. Now, according to the 2019 LNB report on stress in the legal profession in the UK, the profession was actually found to lag behind almost all other sectors in combating mental health. Also in the great resignation, as it became known, many lawyers left the profession due to burnout, exhaustion, stress, and with all of this in mind, Adam, there's a real need for change in the profession. Psychological safety is the opposite yep. of those words I used, combative, competitive, perfectionist, pressurized, controlled, judgmental. It's the foundation of a safe environment where lawyers can collaborate instead of competing, where they can help each other grow instead of judge, and where they're open and curious instead of being controlled and aloof. The, the first step perhaps is to recognize that everyone has a role to play. Some employees believe that leaders are solely responsible for the behaviors in the workplace, but they don't believe they have the power to make changes. Our quest is to be instrumental, to actually bring about awareness, to help lawyers empower themselves and support others to speak up. In this way, they can create a more psychologically safe environment for themselves and all of their colleagues. Um, employees clearly need a supportive and sustainable framework mm. uh, that promotes psychological safety and a lack of that safety will negatively impact law firms. Um, one of the most significant ways, as we said, is that lack of communication and if we look specifically at what's going on in the law firm, if employees don't feel comfortable speaking up, sharing their ideas or concern, that's going to lead to all sorts of things, including missed deadlines, errors, even legal disputes. And additionally, a lack of that psychological safety will invariably lead to low morale, high employee turnover, and ultimately decreased productivity and, pro and profitability. I've dealt with law firms that had a particularly high level of mistrust and tension between departments, between mm -hmm. key partners who were reluctant to share information and where communication was ridiculously strained. And the historic low level of psychological safety in these firms has been the one common denominator. Wow. Yeah, that, that's yeah, such a, a challenge. And so many of those things resonate, I'm sure, with well, it resonates with me and yeah. I'm sure it resonates with those watching. Do you think firms in the UK have now caught up perhaps with their counterparts across the pond in terms of coaching, well-being, resilience, psychological safety? I, 
I feel like it's starting to drip through. I don't know. You've you, you've probably got a sharper perspective. What do you think? Yeah, it's 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 clearly been slow to fully embrace coaching the profession in the UK. Often, when a senior partner was approached in recent years in respect of well-being coaching, that partner would say, uh, "Yes, uh, you know, maybe later we see the merits." That their budgetary constraints, other priorities. But in the very recent past, Adam, I'm happy to say that the penny seems to have finally dropped. Many firms have actually enthusiastically embraced prioritizing the well-being of their key staff, realizing that a lack of well-being invariably would lead to absenteeism, presenteeism, lack of retention of key colleagues, uh, the effect of the reputation of the firm and the resulting inability to maximize profit. And what remains from the perspective of a happily diminishing number of firms is the attitude that you pointed to a few minutes ago that coaching intervention is a soft skill which doesn't have a place in the law profession. Now here with psychological safety is where the fearless organization scan, which I mentioned earlier, excels. This is an intervention that's based on detailed scientific research and an exceptionally well-conceived and constructed scan that actually reveals the level of psychological safety in a given law firm. That, that sounds really helpful. Can you, how, how does that work? How would, would a scan work and how would you, as a coach, say, assist a team of the leadership team in a firm, the team of partners in, in terms of going through this? Sure, Adam. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to work at our coaching entity, Smooth Transitions, with my particularly highly valued colleague, Lindsay Wittenberg. She's one of the UK's most senior and highly rated coaches and psychological safety practitioners. She'll probably be terribly embarrassed if she sees this that I'm saying <laughs> that, but it's the truth. And, and I, I really feel privileged to work with her. We we offer a well-tried and tested intervention, which actually involves five stages. And this is the model that has been shown to work with Amy Edmondson's uh, background in the fearless organization. Firstly, we agree the program of work with a managing or senior partner so that we can understand the team's context, their purpose, their goals, and to address issues that have caused historic challenges. Secondly, then we go on to meet the actual team. This could be a team of equity partners. It could be partners from a particular department within a firm. We discuss what we'll be engaging in to ultimately enhance that psychological safety within the team. We build trust in that meeting between the members of the team and we co-create shared goals, clarifying the process and the rules of engagement. And then the third stage is that actual scan, that fearless organization scan. It's the gathering of the data by way of a very incisive and insightful set of very few key questions. Uh, it only takes uh, five to eight minutes actually to complete. That's the beauty of it, but it really gets to the nub of the issue. And that leads to the scientific measuring of psychological safety in four separate domains. These are the key domains we look at in psychological safety. These are attitude to risk, uh, willingness to help, inclusion and diversity and, and open conversation. And the scan is a very brief, but really highly developed and thoroughly researched measure of psychological safety and it maps how the team members perceive the psychological safety in their immediate team, which is invaluable. Um, once the scan results are in, we then engage in the fourth, and this is the this is where the magic happens, as they say, the team debrief, where we explore the current levels of psychological safety as a team. Importantly, Adam, the actual individual scores remain private to the individual team member, but this facilitates a genuine uplifting and a revealing dialogue where what's working is explored and where areas requiring improvement are identified and worked on. And, and finally then, Adam, there's a fifth stage with the team leaders where outcomes are reviewed, actions are agreed, um, reassessment is offered at a suitable future date, perhaps six months later. And this, of course, gives the benefit of a, a baseline 
as a basis for comparison. Coaching of individual partners is often used within this model as well to great effect to maximize a beneficial outcome and honest open conversation at the team debrief stage. So Adam, in essence, to improve the team's performance, it helps us to know the level of psychological safety in a team. Uh, this is time and time again found to be the critical predictor of how members will learn, how they'll work, and hopefully how they'll succeed together. And based on the results, we facilitate a series of team building workshops and training sessions that focus on building the trust, that communication, the collaboration. We encourage leaders to model the perceived um, and the desired behavior that I talked about earlier and create that safe space for employees to really express themselves. And over time, inevitably, we see significant improvements in communication, in morale, and, uh, and in productivity. Yeah, that, that's powerful. And I'm, I'm sure that would be a, a, a very, such an impactful tool for firms. And what I'll do is put your details below this video. So those who run firms and may be thinking, oh, that's something we could do with, can reach out to you and have a conversation to see how they could take that forward and how you could assist them. But I want to get practical as we finish. Um, and people will be saying, well, how can I start this journey? What are things I can do now? So if you would leave us with some final practical tips in terms of building psychological safe environments and workplaces. Yeah. What's your sort of practical toolkit you can leave us with? Thank you, Adam. Well, maybe a few takeaways. Um, I would say that a firm can start by assessing the current level of psychological safety in the firm. They can do this by being acutely aware, trying to recognize problematic issues and then going on to conduct something like that fearless organization scan. Mm -hmm. um, managing partners, the senior people within the entity should model the desired behaviors. Leaders should take the reins and set the tone for the rest of the organization. So it's essential that they model the behaviors that they actually want to then see in their colleagues. They should foster open and honest communication, encourage employees to speak up without fear of ridicule. They should be encouraged to share ideas and to ask questions. The, the more senior partners perhaps should provide regular feedback. This is sometimes so, so absent. Uh, feedback and recognition of their team's contribution. Employees, all of us as human beings, we need to know that our contribution is valued. So, so important. And I'm spending the past 30 plus years in the law profession, both in this country and from my rather different accent, you will know from South Africa as well. I've witnessed firsthand the issues I've been speaking about today from every perspective, from a new entrant trainee to a senior partner. And I've experienced during that time, the fallout from a lack of psychological mm -hmm. safety. And I've tried really hard in recent years to bring about initiatives in my own firm to enhance psychological safety. And I've been delighted to witness even those small little tangible positive changes which have resulted and become so evident. And equally, when I'm privileged to help a colleague or a firm in some way, I just feel I'm giving back to the profession in some way and just acutely aware of the situation because I've lived it for half my lifetime, over half my lifetime. And Adam, this intervention really, really does make a difference. Every law firm needs its solicitors to be high performing. And mm -hmm. for this, their well-being, their resilience are critical enablers. Perhaps the most significant underpinning factor is in fact psychological safety. When team members feel that safety, they feel trusting, they sufficiently at ease to allow, in reality, their best selves to show up. And their best selves include high quality thinking that will lead to innovation, to ideas, to increased effectiveness and the early identification and remedying of errors without fear of blame. The creation, in essence, of 
an environment where your views are heard, your mm. contribution valued, ultimately and finally an environment where inevitably things are going to lead to well-being, to success and to profit. No, that that's so helpful, Brendan. And certainly you are giving back to the legal profession and, and what you're saying, I think, will make a huge difference. What you said actually reminded me of that, you know, creating that culture where we catch people doing good. So often we catch people out for not doing things, but actually yeah. you know, I'd encourage people, if you run a law firm today, catch somebody doing something good and tell them about it because that makes, about. makes such a difference. Just just finally, if people want to reach out to you in terms of firms who want to do this kind of work or even uh, are you still prepared with working with if there are individual lawyers, barristers? Absolutely. I do a lot of work with individuals and uh, that's within the psychological safety, the well-being, the resilience domain. And uh, they're all really interrelated. But uh, right now, the psychological safety is clearly something that needs to be taken on in a meaningful way by the law profession. Well, Brendan, thank you so much for giving your time to speak to me today and bringing something that you're clearly passionate about, but something that will make a difference both to people as individuals and to firms, both in terms of well-being and to the bottom line. So thank you so much for joining me uh, today, Brendan. If you want to reach thank out to Brendan, I'll put your details below. Thanks a lot, Brendan. Very kind. All the best. Be well. Thank you.